Stay hungry. Stay foolish. Have you ever wanted to disagree with your boss? Speak up about your company's lack of diversity or unequal pay practices? Make a tough decision you knew would be unpopular. We all have opportunities to be courageous at work. But since courage requires risk to our reputations, our social standing, and in some cases, our jobs, we often fail to act, which leaves us feeling powerless and regretful for not doing what we know is right. Our guest is the world's foremost expert on workplace courage. He explains that courage is not a character trait that only a few possess. It's a virtue developed through practice. And with the right attitude and approach, we can learn and hone it like any other skill and incorporate it into everyday life. We welcome friend of the Innovation Show and one of our very early guests on the show, author of Choosing Courage, the Everyday Guide to Being Brave at Work, Jim Dieterch. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's so great to be back with you. It's so great to have you back on the show, Jim. It's been a long, long time coming. And I want to plant a seed here that we're going to uh, let nourish over time. And we'll come back and address it later. Let's share an important fact here. We can explain it later. The seed is your incurable case of RBF, Jim. <laughs> so let's, we'll plant that. We'll say no more about it. We'll plant it. And just to say, I have Jim's book behind me here. I have a copy up for grabs. Just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter and you will be in with a chance to win that book. But I also wanted to connect some dots of the show, Jim, over the years. Jim is both friends with and colleagues with both Ed Hess and indeed Amy Edmondson. And let's give them a shout out because they've been part of both our journeys over the years, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. If we start with uh, Amy Edmondson, a dear friend and colleague uh, for 20 years now, Amy was one of my advisors uh, in my PhD journey and uh, one of the first people I co-authored with. And um, if you sort of circle forward, you know, my original work was on why people speak up or not at work and, and the risks. Um, and, you know, you come full circle now. Amy has written, as of course, uh, many or all of your guests will know, so profoundly about psychological safety. And what I find often now is that uh, Amy and I end up sort of being a one-two. Uh, Amy is brought in to talk about creating the conditions of psychological safety. And then folks will call me and say, uh, look, we absolutely are aspiring to create a psychologically safe environment, but we're not there. We're a long way from there, and we still need people to engage in these important acts of truth and boldness and innovation. Um, can you help with that along the journey? So Amy and I still uh, work in quite close parallel. And then uh, my dear friend, uh, Professor Ed Hess, who has written so profoundly about learning and humility, uh, and frankly, so many of the underlying behaviors and attributes of people who aren't just courageous leaders, but but competently courageous, uh, people who model exactly what they want from others. And so, um, yeah, two profoundly uh, wise people and also people who have just made a huge difference in my own life. Well, a tip of the hat to both Amy and Ed. And uh, Jim, let's get into it because there's so much in the book. And to set context for courage to speak up, you begin the book with the story of Stuart Scott, but while you tell us his front stage successes also revealed a backstage struggle, which is so often the case with these people who break through ceilings, either glass or not. And Stuart Scott was certainly one of those people. Maybe we'll start with that to set some context. Many people who know Stuart Scott, um, the now uh, deceased, uh, but incredible uh, sports center anchor on ESPN, um, you know, by far the most popular uh, sports show, uh, really, certainly in the U.S., but I think around the world. Um, many of us know him for one of two reasons. We either know um, about his multi-year journey with cancer, for which, of course, he was considered courageous in a lot of ways, or we know about uh, his incredible turns of phrase, um, the the really interesting ways in which Stuart Scott took, you know, what had been, frankly, the largely white uh, sort of middle upper class um, style of ESPN and the vocabulary of it, and he made it uh, more accessible to all different types of uh, folks. He brought in turns of phrase, language, etc., that his black listeners um, really resonated with. And 
Unfortunately, it turned out that that made a lot of the old white brass at ESPN uncomfortable. And so what folks don't know is that Stuart Scott was told, tone it down, knock it off, stop talking that way. Uh, and he struggled a lot with that. Um, he, he obviously valued his job and where he had gotten. But he also felt that to sort of suppress that would be inauthentic and would be not serving sort of what to him was a really core constituency. And so he did what was unquestionably a, a bold and perhaps risky move uh, and not maybe the sort of strategy we'd recommend for everybody else. But he he decided that what he was going to do is go on air one day and say, I want to take a moment uh, to talk about sort of my story and, and to congratulate uh, the wise people here at ESPN. And he he went on to say that essentially, you know, I've introduced a lot of interesting vernacular and turns of phrases that, well, some less, you know, some less bold and wise and uh, thoughtful folks would have a problem with. But I want to congratulate my bosses at ESPN for putting me on and being so supportive of my choice of, of language and my style. It's made a huge difference, and of course, having done that, he, you know, he had pinned those folks in a corner because at that point they could, no matter how angry they might have been with him, there's no way they could have fired him. Uh, and so, you know, he chose a very bold way to, you know, quite publicly um, create a context in which he was safe. That story really got to me, I suppose, in a way. Many of the listeners of this show, and and me included. I count myself as a listener to the show because I'm listening intently and learning from great people like you every week. But I wanted to share a, a personal story that I, I've rarely talked about. I, I was a professional rugby player and um, I touched on it in my book, but I didn't give the details. And I feel I feel slightly inauthentic not saying it, but it was a story of essentially what I felt was authenticity. And your book probably gave me the courage to speak up about it, which was I was um, playing for a rugby team and the coach, I was captain at the time. Thing were, things were going really well for me. I was in the starting team, playing well, back in the, uh, the national uh, squad. Uh, things were looking up. And the coach, wh what happens sometimes is that with national games, the players, the senior players go away and they play and then they come back. And we had a load of kind of second tier players who played extremely well. And I felt as captain or, or one of the more senior players in the team, I had a voice that I could dissent with. And I went ahead to the coach and I mentioned to him that I thought by not selecting some of these players was sending a message to the team that was really negative and that was essentially, don't try, why bother? And he, as a result, he said to me, things have been going well for you. Do you agree? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, let's see how you manage it now when things don't go so well. And he never picked me again, unless through injury or for reasons of, of he had to. And it was an early kind of shot across my bow that, that speaking up often doesn't come with the best consequences. But I think it's so in, ingrained in who I am. And I've done it in every organization that I've been in in that I leave if I feel that my principles are being trampled on in some way or that I feel that I don't I don't fit there anymore. And I think so many of our show listeners are the same. And I just wanted to share that with you because I wanted to speak up about it because your book talks about courage of speaking up, but also to share that I'd say so many people are like this in the organizations. Maybe they have been forced to turn a blind eye or they feel they've been forced to turn a blind eye and that I think your book gives us the courage to do that, but also a framework to do so. Yeah, I mean, thank you for sharing that. And if I can quickly, I mean, I think it illustrates a few really important things. I mean, one, uh, I think Patrick Lencioni, you know, he, he wrote about making your values mean something. And I think he got it exactly right. I mean, we, we all tell ourselves we're good people and, and we stand for certain things. Uh, but then when it appears there would be consequences or might be consequences associated with standing for those values, so often we stand down. And I think he got it exactly right in saying, if you can't point to instances of pain or loss or hardship that came from standing from your values, they're probably just aspirational values. They're not actually core values because core values sometimes cost us something. Um, and, I, you know, you, you learned that. The second thing I think it illustrates, and maybe we'll come back to this, is that um, 
Sometimes there is short-term pain and real cost or loss. But it turns out, and I, I hear you saying this, that quite few people actually over the longer term look back with regret about what they did. Uh, yes, they know they suffered some consequence in the short term, but they're proud and they say they would do it again. Um, and then the, the third thing that I think, you know, is so important in the context of organizational life is sometimes indeed the most courageous act, especially after we've tried in other ways, sometimes the most courageous act is the willingness to leave the organization. Uh, and, you know, to put it bluntly, sometimes we're just telling ourselves a story that um, we can be the person we want to be and stand for the things we want to stand for and stay in an organization that doesn't support that. It's just not true. Sadly, it's not true. And so sometimes the, the boldest move, the most courageous move is, is to leave. And one of the things I do talk about in the book is not just sort of knowing what's so core or central to you that you'd be willing to do that, but also um, making choices about, you know, keeping yourself so externally valuable and mobile, having options, um, living a, a lifestyle that isn't exactly up to your means so that if you did have to transition, you'd be able to do that. Um, because indeed, sometimes the only way to really be the authentic you or the best you is to leave. Um, yeah. and I think we just have to be willing to admit that. And I think the other thing is in a world of where we'll probably work in several organizations, you know, this is going to become more mainstream. One of the things I find is courage, the courage to actually leave the organization to go and pursue your dreams. And you're right, Jim, as well, the regret thing. I regret that not for one second, I think. If I didn't do it, I'd regret it worse and I'd have this sick feeling in my stomach. And I think that's a really important factor. But I'd love to, if you'd give your your definition, so you give it a, quite an academic definition of workplace courage, but then you contextualize it as well. I'd love if you'd share this with our audience. Yeah. So let's just make it really simple. Um, I think workplace courage, um, an act of workplace courage is simply any action you do for what to you and others is a worthy cause, um, despite perceived risk. So let's just, just two elements. You do something that you think is worthy, despite believing there's potential risks. Um, you know, when, when you really kind of cut through all the academic ease, that's all we're talking about is things that are important to us or others, but hard. Yeah, and I think it's important, Jim, I, I pulled a quote here because you say, unless we normalize acting courageously, seeing it as a possibility and responsibility for everyone, too many of us will keep wanting or waiting for others to do it. And we hide uncomfortably as you talk about creating those stories behind assertions that we can't all be a Nelson Mandela or a Gandhi, or that we're going to do it later when we have more power and then those days never come and then we live with that regret as well. Yeah, I mean, one thing, you know, you, you may or may not notice is I, I said I'm interested in in workplace acts, in courageous acts. And I think that's actually very important. Uh, I'm not interested in the courageous person. Uh, I'm not interested in courage as a description of some kind of personality trait or rare individual. Uh, first of all, I don't actually think there's any good science that behind this notion that there are sort of people born with some courage trait or valor trait. Uh, I, I'm not convinced by that. And, and second, uh, it's precisely important if we want to get away from this notion that, well, you know, there's a few Mandela's or a few whoever's, uh, but not me, thank God for them, not me, uh, then we have to stop talking about courage as if it is a, uh, a function of who one is by some kind of birthright or personality trait. And we have to start saying, no, what we're interested in is, is are the specific opportunities that we all face a good percentage of the time to stand up and do something or not. So I'm interested in acts that are courageous, not personalities. And, and I think, frankly, we will never get to the place where we accept the notion um, that it's a responsibility for everybody until we start thinking about it as a set of behaviors, not a personality trait. So Jim, I'd love if you'd share why we hold back and there's psychological risk which is essentially an evolutionary trait from the, our days in the tribe where if we got ejected from the tribe it meant death right so maybe you'll talk to us about that but then there was there's real risks for example in the usa you tell us most modern organizations 
that are full of risks, even in places like the USA, where the First Amendment of the Constitution protects free speech. People have these at-will contracts, for example, and they can say whatever they want about the government. But when it comes to the organizations or the leaders in those organizations, they're at real risk. Yeah, I mean, let's start with this First Amendment issue uh, and get that out of the way. The First Amendment protects your right sort of out on the street um, to say what you want, for example, about a government official um, to gather without harm from the government. But for employees, the vast majority of whom in the U.S. are at will, meaning sort of can be fired for just about any reason, uh, the First Amendment, your First Amendment rights stop the second you enter the door. In fact, uh, they really stop any time the company thinks you're representing them in a way that affects their optics, no matter where you happen to be. So, you know, I can say President so-and-so is a fool, an idiot, whatever. No consequence to me politically. Uh, if in the organization it gets passed to my boss that I called him or her an idiot, I can be fired on the spot. So, w first of all, if you're outside the U.S., you got to dispense with the notion that the U.S. is this beautiful, safe space for voice at work. It's not. Um, in fact, some of the data I've collected suggests that the U.S. is no better on the whole than countries we would assume to be quite different, like China, for example. Um, and in fact, uh, it is probably safer to speak up on the whole uh, in some of the Benelux countries, Northern Europe. Uh, and I think the reason that's the case is that not only are you sort of an at-will employee generally in the U.S., uh, but in the U.S., your health care is tied to where you work. Your retirement tends to be tied to where you work. Benefits for your children tend to be tied toward where you work. So not only can you be fired, but these very important basic needs are tied to your employment in ways they're not um, in other social democracies. So, I mean, first of all, let's just dispense with the notion that people aren't afraid at work in the U.S. They are. Um, beyond any evolutionary reasons, whatever, why we sort of have a, a natural tendency to, you know, be afraid of or worried about powerful others, those in authority. Uh, we also have very real reasons to fear like career and economic risks, no question. Uh, but it's also true, as you noted, that people have huge social fears. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned evolution. Like if you think about most of our time on earth as a species, if you were, uh, if you were to be cast out of your small clan or tribe, you faced certain deaths, death, right? You, you couldn't survive alone. So it's very, very logical that while it's not true death today, the notion of social death is still very, very real in our psyche. We are terrified of the notion of being ostracized or isolated. And that makes even telling the truth or being bold toward peers and others with no formal power over us hard. Um, you mentioned psychological risks, right? Why don't people take stretch assignments? Why don't they push themselves? Why don't they speak? Well, in a lot of cases, like if you look at brilliant scientists who are obviously intelligent, who wouldn't be fired, why don't they speak up in blue sky meetings or other contexts? They say, because I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to be embarrassed in front of my peers. Um, so they're real psychological risks. And then you know, sadly, we, we tend to think, well, physical risks are only the domain of, you know, firefighters and police officers and military personnel. But the sad truth is, if you talk to most folks who deal with any kind of customer service uh, aspect, you know, bars, restaurants, lots of other, they can tell you quite frightening stories, even of, you know, being accosted in various ways um, or threatened physically. And so, you know, sadly, the workplace still has a whole lot of legitimate risks. You know, I, I, I thought about that one about the, you, you mentioned about, you know, compensation or healthcare being tied to your role. And I, I think in an age of where people want more meaning in their roles, there's this payoff between that security and the chasing their dreams, essentially. And yeah. The golden handcuffs, or as I call it, the fur-lined mousetrap, where you're you're stuck because incentives, yeah. maybe it's stock options, you know, whatever is tied to your pay pack. And then on top of that, right, so that's one thing is that, but then you have a spouse or you have kids and they have a reliance on you. So for example, in the States, I know school, you know, paying for school for, for kids is huge cost for people and it's a worry and a concern. So they don't want to rock the boat. And I get that. And I think 
that needs to be considered as well. And you talk about this, the golden handcuffs. Uh, one of the things we that thinking about golden handcuffs reveals is another myth, which is uh, this is hard for people at lower levels or or, you know, early in their careers. And then suddenly it gets better. And I mean, I, I you know, with MBA students and other younger folks, I, I deal a lot with this because when we say, like, would you take this action? Would you be bold? Would you speak truth? They say, well, no, 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 not now. I, I got to get a while down the road. I got to get up a few levels. Then I'm going to do it. And I, you know, I sort of have to burst that bubble and say, look, here, I've studied this a lot. And here's what I can tell you. Uh, there's only more gold in the handcuffs <laughs> the higher up you get. Uh, you know, what you stand to lose is larger. And, you know, because of the basic pyramidal nature of almost all organizations, um, your equivalent opportunities, should you blow it at the organization you're in, dwindle. And so people, um, I, I don't say all this to say like, wow, we're just building a great case for nobody to ever speak up. I say it because I think it, you know, part of getting people to to speak up and to invest the energy to learn to do it well is to be realistic. And part of being realistic is to say there's no magic trait. Uh, it's also, there's no magic time. I'm not going to get to some level or some stage where it's suddenly easy. Those are all just sort of rationalizations to not do it and to not do the work to do it well. And so the first step is to kind of let go of that stuff and just say, I got to get to work. It was an experience for me reading the book because it brought back old memories. I mentioned there about the rugby. Fast forward maybe eight years or so, and I was in a very senior role, leading change in a, a very organ, uh, archaic organization, a legacy organization, put it that way. And I remember this day so clearly, clearly, Jim. So I had well paid, I had a pension, I had a job that was no stress, it was very easy to do. And I remember the day where I looked in the mirror and I was like, kind of going, come on, man, you're going to rot away here. Right. So there was that. Right. And then and in, in the mirror, I could see my wife and my kids and the threat of throwing that away for for me, essentially, which was kind of felt selfish to me. But it all came down to this this show, actually. So this is where, where the origins of this show. So I started this show during that role and I, and I purposely did it before or after work. So nobody could ever call me up and say it was work eating into work time. And I was sat down and I was like, look, look to my boss is like, what, what do you want from me? And she said, I want you to stop writing. I want you to stop doing that sh stupid show. And I want you to be at your desk more now. And I was we're working in innovation and change. And I remember just, I remember the moment. And, and I think we all have these moments and it's like the, it's, it's not the angel and the devil. It's like a, a future you and another future you, and you kind of look and you're kind of going, which one do I choose here? And I, I remember standing up and going, I think that's the wrong decision. And thereafter, I started, like you describe in the book, cracks started to show where it was like, got a letter from HR about something that was totally unrelated. And they, it, it was almost like building a case. And, and what they did was they removed any psychological safety for me, bringing it back to Amy's work that made it very uncomfortable. And I just made the decision that I wasn't going to work there anymore even though I had all this opportunity. And as you talk about the security of that role, and I just don't think I could live with myself if I'd stayed. But on top of that, my wife supported me through it in that it wasn't convenient for her at all. And then if you think of the optics, it looks bad. It looks like you failed or society starts to judge you. And I think you need to let go of that as well to make these decisions. Yeah, it's interesting. You certainly know more about um this specific point uh, that I'm going to start with than I do, but it's, it, it strikes me as interesting that when we talk about like straight up the, the domain of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs, um, having failed a few times, right? A few startups at bomb before you make it, it's kind of a badge of honor, right? It's, it's considered the reality of the, of the business, but for the rest of us, we don't look at it the same way. And, and in a sense, that's tragic, right? It, it's, because it's almost like we're admitting that, well, you know, entrepreneurs, innovators are going to take sufficient risks in the pursuit of some important thing that they'll fail because that's life in that domain. But most of us are going to be so safe that it will be a taint if we have any of these. And that, that's that's really depressing. Uh, and I think, you know, 
sometimes, um, you know, people have situations like you had where the, the decision, if you will, starts to be facilitated by the way people are treating you. Um, one of the things, you know, that's such a privilege about uh, being a professor, especially if you teach a lot of exec MBA level folks, is and these are folks 35, 40, 45, who have, you know, let's say 15 to 20 years work experience. And one of the things I noticed after a number of years, and I think it's why my classes, which were a combination of tools and skills, but also an attempt to really inspire people to find and pursue their passions. And I think the reason it, it resonated so much is I would kind of look out and I would have this sense, and I, I, I mean this with no disrespect at all to any particular person, that I was kind of witnessing like Thoreau's statement about like, most men, most people living lives of quiet desperation. You know, it was like, it was like people were 35, 40, 45, and they were, they were asking themselves, like, is this all there is? Like, I've been doing this 50, am I going to do this another 20, 25 years? Um, and, you know, with every, like, fiber in my being, I would try to say, no, don't let it be that. Don't let it be that. It's, it's not all there is or should be, uh, but it's going to take your, your willingness to do some courageous things in the face of, of systems. Because if we're really honest about it, you know, and, and again, you know way more about this than me, uh, there's hardly an organization around today that doesn't espouse the value of innovation <laughs> and creativity, right? I mean, who, who would come out anymore in the year 2021 and say, like, we're anti-innovation. We want to be the same way we've always been. <laughs> Nobody says that, right? But in fact, when you look at the way the system is set up, what it rewards, what it punishes, how its leaders behave, the truth is most of our systems today still are set up to get you to behave like everybody else and like we've behaved in the past. And that sets the conditions for courageous action every day. And it's so useful. The book is so useful for people working in change initiatives and innovation and taking it to that level to innovation and call it organizational threat. You've had countless senior executives you talk about in the book that tell you that they don't tell their bosses or boards what's really going on for fear of repercussions. I, I thought of that shooting yeah. the messenger, that, that bias. And then on top of that, they wait. So the organizational leaders and, you know, the, the irony of the word doesn't escape me. Leaders wait for public opinion to tell them what to do or else they'll try and go, well, let's let a, a competitor figure it out and copy what they do. And they are leaders of those organizations. Yeah. Again, if I think about, you know, my, my students, um, often we'll be discussing some case. I'll say like, well, what should you do? And the, the response will be, uh, well, I would give, like, I'll make them actually give a, like an announcement to the press about their decision. And they'll come out and they'll say like, um, we, at this point, we are studying the issue intently and, um, we will get back to you soon. And then I, I kind of tease them and say, oh, nice job. A plus for kicking the can down the road. <laughs> and, then I, and then I say, why'd you do that? And they say, well, I think, you know, you got to wait and see what others do. And then I say, and it's, it sounds harsh, but I, but I mean it in a loving way. I say, oh, so you're aspiring to be a great follower, not a leader, huh? And I think it's, you know, it's often kind of a powerful moment where they – they maybe for the first time sort of internalize, like if, you're, if your orientation toward life is wait and see what others are doing, then by definition, let's stop talking about you as a leader. Uh, and, you know, look, there's lots of causes for this. Certainly all the reasons for conformity we just talked about. Um, honestly, I think uh, a huge part of consulting, the consulting industry is not actually designed to help firms find their true unique way or path. It's about basically providing a big plan that says, here's what everybody else in the industry does and what your opportunity might be. So I'm not even convinced consulting for the most part is about helping people or organizations find their unique way. I, I agree. And I, I work in consulting, Jim, and sometimes I feel it's like a, an insurance policy. So it's if the plan fails, it was that guy or girl it was it was yeah. them it was the consultants yeah. got it wrong moving on then so let's let's bring it to other places because you go everywhere with courage there's no courage stone unturned in the book and you share how 
not speaking up can actually lead to huge ethical issues. And you mentioned, for example, and, and I, I'm not letting them away with it, man. I say it whenever I can, the Volkswagen <laughs> Dieselgate problem, because they've, in, in some ways, through diversification and owning other brands like Skoda, they, they, their sales are still rocketing. And it's like we have such a short memory. And I think we're, we're implicit in, in it. We're complicit if we, if we don't speak up about these things and we let people away with it in the name of profit when we're, our planet is burning and these kind of scandals just are brushed under the rug. Yeah, two thoughts, right? <laughs> because that's, that's depressing and true. Um, I mean, first, if you go to the actual scandals, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is the importance of, of creating conditions where people speak up immediately and where you attend to that constructively immediately. Because while I don't know the exact details of what happened at Volkswagen or Wells Fargo or all these other, you know, things that became terrible scandals. What we generally do know from the reading, you know, of the, of the record is that in every one of those cases, lots of people knew what was going on, right? Like you didn't design that whole false system for Volkswagen's, you know, emission. You didn't, you didn't have practices at, at Wells Fargo that were being, you know, employed by thousands of sales agents or whatever, um, with one or two people knowing lots and lots and lots of people knew for quite some time. And so, you know, one of the things I say is, look, um, I'm not trying to encourage people to become organizational martyrs who like, you know, go public to the New York Times or the Guardian or whatever. Uh, I'm actually saying that both leaders and everyday employees, if you want to prevent it from becoming that level of disaster, do something about it sooner. I think it is true that and this doesn't have as much to do with, I guess, courage as sort of personal choice and responsibility. You know, we can criticize Volkswagen and Walmart and anybody else we want, right? Um, but then if we still go to Walmart to save, you know, 15 cents on a gallon of milk, or we still buy Volkswagen because, geez, it's, it's the cutest uh, new model or whatever, you know, like in the end, is it really reasonable to expect people in organizations to behave in ways that reflect their values, that stand for things. If we ourselves as consumers, I mean, that's one reality of a market environment is if we as consumers don't use our dollars to sort of vote our values, then we're fooling ourselves if we think it's just gonna magically happen. Let's move to say, for example, you're, I'm working in an organization, the leader, my team leader doesn't speak up, doesn't defend somebody, doesn't speak up for them doesn't speak up against something that's unethical. And you say, when, when leaders fail the courage test, their team described the event as a loss of faith in the competency and ability of the department manager from that day forth. And another one, for example, you say, these are just some quotes from the book, they were disgusted and saddened that they were overseen by such a cowardly individual with such low moral fiber. And it has an immense impact on team trust when a leader of a team doesn't speak up. And you t say that it's really about legacy and regret. Yeah, one of the things, again, that probably has a lot to do with the way our brain evolved, you know, to survive is um, bad is so much stronger than good. So, you know, you can think you're sort of chugging along as a, as a decent leader. You're building trust and respect. Um, and you might have done that a whole lot of times. But what I've seen is it only takes one instance where you just let your people hang out to dry, right? You're in a meeting and you see the the, the bigger boss beaten up on your team and you sit there on your hands. Um, you see something being described that you know darn well your boss disagrees with or knows is a lie and he sits on his hands. Um, any instance where it's just obvious that there was an important right thing to do and you see your boss choose to not do that. Um, it actually is pretty stunning how those single incidents, you're right. I mean, people use words like morale was down for years, lost all credibility, lost faith. Um, it's, it's really powerful. Um, and, you know, I guess w one thing to say, I guess, to, to those in leadership positions is uh, you, you're obviously going to choose what you're going to do or not do, but at least like do it with awareness. When you chicken out, if you think people didn't notice, you're wrong. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of research that shows that people in power are, are literally have 
you know, something like five to 15 times more visual attention paid to them. So there's just no question that people are noticing your choices as a leader. So let's move to speaking truth to power, because you give us a list of behaviors that represent a comprehensive set of ways that people with less power can do worthy things that are risky primarily because they might incur the regret or anger of disappointment in themselves or those with more power at work. So let's share some of those behaviors at a high level, Jim. Well, so there's, you know, if we think of the, the ones that uh, people are most likely to think of, right, it's, you know, I called out my boss for being unethical or doing something illegal. Again, those are kind of the disaster ones that first come to mind. But there's all sorts of daily opportunities, you know. You're having a meeting and you either tell the truth or not about a process or policy that's working or not. You know, you work in sales, you've got some script or new approach. You're in marketing, you've got some new, you know, campaign. Do you tell the truth or not about like, this is what customers are actually saying about it. This is why it's efficient or inefficient. So it can just be policies, practices, new ideas. Do you tell the truth? So there's this huge range from just very every day, this is not optimal to the much bigger things. And then, of course, there are the difficult things that involve, you know, when your boss says something itself, which is harmful or, or inappropriate or sexist or whatever might be the case, you know, the interpersonal stuff. Uh, and then some of the other behaviors, you know, which are about truth to power, but they're a little bit less about sort of directly challenging or confronting your boss. And they're more about things like, are you willing to, to go promote, go to bat for your team for more resources? Are you willing to really work hard to get somebody on your team promoted or an opportunity? Uh, when your team makes a mistake, are you willing to stand up and, and own it and take the hit for it to protect them? So there are ways that any of us, you know, not only can sort of speak our truth to power, but if you're in any kind of leadership role, formal or informal, there are also ways in which you can choose to protect or promote others to power. And that can sometimes be risky too. Jim, I'd love to riff on that a bit because you you run you you mentioned an experiment that you run with your students and i thought we'd run it for audience and to give you context and tee you up here you say courage is a matter of perspective not fact acts are considered courageous by some precisely because there's a good chance that others will not appreciate what's been done and this is the wayne r d in cancer and diabetes thought experiment that you talk about one that will resonate with many of our audience who work in innovation and in R&D. I'd love if you'd take us through this. Sure. So indeed, I wanted to explore this whole issue that like courage is not some objective fact. It's because it's about risk and worthiness. Um, any one of us can make a judgment about how, was the act worthy and, and was it risky? And so I designed this simple uh, setup where I said, you know, Wayne is the head of a research team. Uh, he's the head of R&D. There's a lot. He has a lot of research teams working under him in, you know, different therapeutic areas. Uh, and Wayne goes to a meeting with the president of R&D who sort of slams one of his teams uh, and says, I want you to shut that down, essentially, and allocate those resources to other therapeutic areas. And, uh, and, and Wayne disagrees fundamentally. He thinks the R&D president's got it totally wrong, that this di Diabetic therapeutic areas doing really well. So he disagrees. Um, he disagrees with the R and D president, and he actually goes to the CEO and says, "I think the R and D president's wrong, and I'm not gonna reallocate these resources." So I describe this basic scenario of, of you know your boss telling you shut it down, do something, and and you being willing, Wayne, the R and D head being willing to say, "No, I'm not doing that." Uh, and then what I do is say, okay, you've now read this scenario. Imagine you are. And then I put people in different roles. I say, you imagine you're one of Wayne's diabetes team members. Or imagine you're Wayne. Or imagine you're um, the CEO. Or imagine you are the R&D president, Wayne's boss, who just got, if you will, defied. Uh, and I say, answer a set of questions. And four or five of the questions are essentially synonyms for courageous. You know, Wayne's act was brave, courageous, bold. And then there's another five or six questions that are essentially like we can say measuring stupid. So, question, you know, uh, words like Wayne's acts were defiant, insubordinate, inappropriate, foolish. And what I found is 
um, all the perspectives except one. So if you're weighing, if you were responding as the actor himself, the CEO, so who's the skip level boss, Wayne's subordinates, they all say the actor was very courageous and not dumb, not insubordinate. One role, Wayne's boss, the guy who got acted against or defied said the actor was much less courageous and much more stupid and defiant. Now remember, these people were not actually the boss or Wayne or the subordinate, but just the thought experiment of either being any of the other actors or the authority figure created this huge pattern of difference, which I think, you know, actually quite beautifully illustrates acts are courageous or risky precisely because somebody sees it differently than the actor. It's a fantastic thought experiment. And it really does put you on the spot because you, you, you enter into part two of the book, actually, where you have to actually consider all the empathy and the seeing things from the other side's perspective. All those things are so important. So I thought we'd move on to that part because we, we accept we need more courageous acts at work. We accept uh, many of our listeners are probably... Uh, reminiscing on instances where they might have stood up, maybe firing a customer who was rude to one of their colleagues. Maybe it was a leader not standing up for one of their teams and shielding them from some abuse from somewhere else, etc. We've we've all had those moments. But you then introduce the courage ladder, and I, and this is okay, Jim. Well, what can we do about it? And you dedicate a whole section of the book. So perhaps you'd share some ideas of the courage ladder. Yeah, so the essence of the courage ladder is to say, um, we all have fears or risks, you know, things that feel too hard for us right now. Um, I think Scott Peck, uh, I mentioned this in the book, Scott Peck, I think said it exactly right. He said, you know, most people think courage is the absence of fear. No, the absence of fear is some kind of brain damage. Uh, courage is the willingness to go ahead. So I start from the premise of saying, look, if you're a normal person, you got things at work that are hard. Um, you got things at work that are that would require some courage on your part. But what I can't possibly know is what are they for you? You know, what is it about your personality, your lived experience, uh, your skill set, etc., that makes certain things? You know, if you and I talk long enough, we might realize, uh, God, I I hate uh, this. Is not actually true, but we might realize, like, I hate. Um, I hate conflicts with authorities and I avoid them like the plague, but I don't have any problem actually telling the truth to peers or subordinates or whatever. Um, and you might say, you know, um, I got no problem. I tell it like it is to people in power and I'm willing to walk away. But oh my God, if I worry that a peer, a friend would be angry at me or God forbid they would start to cry, uh, oh my God, I'm not doing that. Right? So all of us are different. So the idea of the courage ladder is to say, you know, do a self-assessment and ask yourself, what are a series of things I would like to be able to do and do skillfully that are anywhere from at the bottom rung uh, of the ladder, you know, a little hard for me, cause me a little bit of distress right now, up to, you know, that sort of biggest boldness, like I'm quitting my job, I'm telling my boss, <laughs> like it is, right, whatever it might be. I say, you know, and put some at different levels, you know, like if you think about subjective distress, you know, put some at two, some four, some six, you know, build the ladder sort of with appropriate sort of rungs. And, and the idea of the ladder, I think, is, is twofold. It's to say, so first of all, you, you beyond just sort of, you have to make it personal to yourself. Um, one, there are two things that I think are true uh, when you, you tend to say, hey, be more courageous. What happens is people think of the scariest thing. They think, I want to quit my job. Um, and there's two problems with that. First of all, if you only start with the scariest thing, you're just not that likely to do it. It's too hard, right? And the second thing is, if you were to try to do it, you might fail so miserably that it only would confirm in your mind, stay away from courageous acts. Uh, you can think about, like, sports is a good analogy. Like, if I decide I wanted to be in better condition, I don't try to run a marathon, because first, I'll never go out of the house. And second, if I did try to run as far as I could the first day, I'd be so sore, it'd be so pathetic, that I'd quit running and fail at the goal. So I say build that ladder and then actually make a commitment to start at the bottom 
Because at the bottom, you know, all learning theory says you want an action. Learning comes from, new knowledge comes from something that's challenging enough to provide motivation, but not so challenging that you can't have some success, which builds self-efficacy, it builds motivation to keep going. So we all need to kind of build a unique ladder for ourselves, and then we need to start at a reasonable place. And, and then what I talk about is, you know, in the book, is a whole host of strategies for what are some of the concrete things you can do to start building those skills. I love the personalized impact of it. So the idea that, you know, your fear is not the same as mine. So, and, and Jim in the book gives us a ladder that we can start with as well. So Jim, I, I wanted to move on because uh, you talk about some of the characteristics here and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna touch on one to connect the dots to what we started on earlier on. And this one is so, valuable and I, i've seen this good and bad where if somebody is a good character you know in change initiatives or innovation if they are warm and friendly and get on with people they're much more likely to be able to sell change within the organization as opposed to the opposite and this ties back to what we opened with earlier on in the show about rbf i'd love if you'd uh, you'd expand on this one yeah. Okay. So let me expand at the, at the broad level, and then I'll go back to this particular story. Um, you know, if you think about it, when you're going to, whether it's you're going to sort of confront somebody about something difficult, or you're going to ask, like, at the change level, you're going to ask, you know, could I have resources? Could I have a commitment to do something different? In essence, what you're saying is, do you trust? I mean, at the base of it is, do you trust me? Because only a fool would take seriously the input to change themselves or to invest resources they're responsible for in someone who's not trustworthy. Right? That, that's a completely logical, reasonable thing. So what I talk about is the need to be seen as a combination of both warm and competent. So warm is really, you know, it doesn't mean are you necessarily fluffy, it, but it means do people see you as benevolent, as having their interests, the organization's interests at heart? In other words, like if you tell me, hey, hey, Jim, um, you need to work on X, Y, Z. Are you telling me it uh, because you actually care about me or because you've got it in for me and want to do me harm, etc.? So one is, do, do you trust me in the sense of am I benevolent, warm, do I have integrity? The other thing is competence. You know, if I'm saying, hey, I think our approach to X is off. Let's do this instead. Let's go in the direction Y. And we're going to need resources, people, commitments, etc. If you're saying, hey, I, I like the idea, but Jim can't pull that off, then you'd be a fool to invest in that. So you got to be warm and competent, right? In Especially in organizational settings, it really matters. So if we go back to this RBF, you know, I became conscious uh, a number of years ago that because I'm you know, I'm a bigger guy, I'm, uh, I talk loud, I'm, I'm animated, I'm assertive. Um, and because just the natural, um, expression on my face, especially when I'm really listening is very, um, is very serious. What did I do? <laughs> yeah. So this created a barrier, um, you know, to, to people wanting to be honest in, in, especially when they didn't know me and, um, you know, I would get this feedback. Yeah. You look pissed off. You look like you want to kill somebody. So but I, I wasn't. I was really just listening. And it just happens to be the way my mouth sits naturally. And so I started to say to folks at the very beginning when I'd work with a group, I started to say, look, you know, before we get started, I just want you to know something about me. Um, I think it's useful for you to know. Uh, I suffer from this sort of, you know, clinical medical condition. It's not fixable, uh, but I just want you to know about it. It's also, you know, don't worry. It's no risk. But I suffer from this incurable case of RBF, resting bitch face. And, you know, people would laugh. And I, and, and I found that uh, it was a very simple icebreaker. It was a moment of me sort of like revealing something about myself that, you know, you could say is a vulnerability or a less than pleasant reality. Uh, but it sort of personalized me. It made me seem warmer to people. And, and you know, and... I mean, I would work with some groups and then, you know, like their leader or whatever, like if I was doing a hypo program, you know, whoever ran the program, you know, they'd say to me, oh, don't forget to tell the hypo, don't forget to tell the RBF story. So clearly, you know, <laughs> this, this worked. Um, 
But here, here's, I told you I was going to sort of tell you the, the follow-up. Uh, the follow-up is, in the last few months, uh, you know, because rightly so, right, we're in a very sensitive uh, moment about language and about the ways, um, inadvertently, you know, people engage in microaggressions. They say things that, that you know, stereotype uh, and create harm through stereotypes. A couple people had the courage, and I know it wasn't easy for them, um, had the courage to say to me after a session, say, hey, everybody laughed. I might be over, you know, reacting. You know, they they hedged. But the feedback two different people gave me independently in two different environments was, um, even though you were making that about yourself, you were clearly teasing yourself, and you were using the word bitch in the context of RBF, uh, the word bitch is a very gendered term. It's something that women only have been called historically and in a negative way. And though it's not your intent, um, it's possible that while 80 or 90 or 95% of people are laughing, somebody's feeling hurt. Uh, and I thought about that for a while. And I have to admit, you know, like all of us, at first I felt a little defensive and like, oh, come on, can't people, you know, I'm. it's about me and I'm not... Um, and then I finally realized that uh, I'm not very skilled, and, and I'm not very funny, um, and I'm not actually authentically interested in connection if the only way I can create it is to continue to use a phrase that humanizes me but potentially offends somebody. And so I've just decided, you know, I told you that quite a while ago, and I, I, I've just decided in the last few months... I'm not going to use that anymore. Uh, I should be capable enough of finding other ways to personalize and create that perception of warmth without potentially alienating somebody. Um, and for me, you know, it's this it's a really profound learning because on the one hand, you know, this is a classic case of having the really completely good intentions, but inadvertently saying something that could have had the opposite effect of my intentions. And if I feel good about anything, it's that I had a couple people who, who did feel safe enough to come to me and tell me that. Uh, because in the end, right, I mean, we can say we have to be more courageous, but none of us will ever be anything close to perfect. And so if we can't create the conditions where people come and tell us the truth, we're, we're never going to get there. We're never going to be our best selves. Well, thank you for sharing it, Jim, because, you know, I... I... I teed you up and you didn't say, no, let's leave that. And hopefully this will be the last time you'll have to tell the story. So I appreciate you saying that and uh, good call on the, the courage of the people to bring it forth to you. So you yeah. do, you're obviously doing your job there. But I, Jim, I wanted to bring it back because we've only about 10 minutes. I wanted to bring it back to innovation and the idea of framing your position, selling an idea. And I loved what you said there. You said are often our ideas, whether their merits are good or bad, they go nowhere. To avoid these types of situation, we must try to see our target's interests. So I'm thinking here about the change maker in a legacy organization, seeing the legacy organization's interests as currencies with which we can bargain. So therefore, we need to know what the strategic priorities are in the first place. One of the things I've just learned by sort of teaching this area and watching this you know, over and over and over for so long is, uh, it seems that everything we've learned about how to pitch or persuade is essentially to, to ask ourselves, well, what do I find most compelling here? And then to craft sort of a beautiful narrative around that and pitch it. Um, and in a sense, that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Because, I mean, after all, if you controlled the decision, if you had all the resources you need, if you could get the organization to adopt your innovation, your idea, uh, you're not pitching to anybody anyway. <laughs> it's precisely because you don't have the control that you're trying to persuade somebody. And if, as soon as you acknowledge that, which right, nobody will push back on that, uh, as soon as you acknowledge that, then you should be willing to see that the, the corollary of that is therefore what you find most persuasive actually doesn't matter. It's what the person you need to convince finds most pervasive, or sorry, persuasive. So simple examples. Uh, let's say that I respond um, really well to um, somebody telling me about something we have to fix, 
because it's a great opportunity and it's so consistent with who we are culturally as an organization. So that's, so I go and I make a pitch. Uh, you know, this is, this is a brilliant opportunity for us to grow and expand and it's so consistent with who we are. But it turns out the person who controls the decision, um, they're not actually that compelled about opportunities. What they're really worried about is threats. I act when I'm worried about something. And it turns out, you know, they're comfortable with the idea that the culture's strong enough. And they're worried about, are we going to make money or not doing this? And so I go in there, you rah rah about opportunity and culture, and I just, I missed the mark. Because they would have responded to threat framing or economic framing. And there are just lots of other examples. Some of it is is realizing that, look, what you right now are compelled is a top five issue for the company might not at all actually be on the top five list of the person you're pitching to. So if you're smart, you figure out what that person's top five list are and you find a way to connect your issue, your idea to their priority set. Again, that's about framing. Um, a lot of times the framing is, you know, about, if you will, sort of the business issue or the rational elements. Sometimes it's about actually just really knowing the person. Um, I developed an exercise. I, I have an exercise I developed to help, help people work on this pitching and framing. And I purposefully put the bios of the two people they're going to be pitching to. And in those bios, I purposefully put things like um, John's daughter is a environmental sustainability major at Reed College, a very, very sort of progressive uh, college, and a set of things like that. Uh, because what I wanted to see is, would students read that carefully enough to, in their pitches, say, you know, in addition to this being, you know, a great business move for us and important with who we are, you know, I know, I know how much this matters to you and your own family, I mean, your own daughter, you know, I, I, I wrote that to see whether people would look for the hooks to connect. And of course, very, very few do it. Because again, we're in our own head. We're not really taking the perspective of the person we're pitching to. There's uh, so much in it. And Jim gives a whole list of these kind of exercises, these kind of scenarios, etc. But Jim, there's one that I loved because oftentimes the change maker or the innovator or the catalyst in an organization who's driving change sees the world very, very differently. And they often see those people who run the legacy organization as blockers of change. And you say, no matter how you say it, there's an implicit criticism of the status quo. The key, therefore, is to say things that don't make others seem like you're criticizing them because you're essentially criticizing their prior or current choices or behaviors. And you suggest one way to do this is to frame what you're proposing as taking the next step because language is so critical when we're making change in organizations. Yeah, it's, it's so true. I mean, I think, again, no matter what our intent, um, when we're saying, hey, we should now do X, what the person is going to hear is whatever else we've been doing is not good enough or it's a problem or it's old fashioned. Um, and so just choices like saying, you know, we can take this forward together or we can take the next step or um, or using language that essentially helps the person you're talking to understand that what you're saying is we've already been so successful. We've already seen such a payoff from this that wouldn't it be excellent to take it to the next level. So learning to use language that essentially says I don't have to destroy and eliminate and beat up what exists to get somewhere else. I can celebrate it. And I can talk about evolving. Uh, you know, Tachi Yamada, when he ran the global health program at the Gates Foundation, uh, he came in and there was this grand challenges program. And I won't go into why, but he thought um, that there was a way it could be much more effective. But he also knew that you know, grand challenges itself wasn't very old, that people were quite invested in it. And so he didn't say... Uh, he, he had a, quite a different idea, but he didn't say, like, we're canning grand challenges, we're starting a new program, because he knew that would have hurt and offended a lot of people. So what he said is, we're going to take it to the next level, and we're going to go from grand challenges to grand challenges explorations. So he largely kept the name. He added a word, but simply adding that 
word allowed him really to have an almost entirely different approach to the to the situation. And so, yeah, there's a lot we can do to bring people along by using the language of we and building on, not destroying. Yeah, I love that. I really love that. Jim, I, I'm going to pull an end quote. I, I pulled a quote that I absolutely love. I'm going to say that quote and then actually... I'd love a few close today's show. Before I do that, I, I really recommend to our audience that they take the Truth to Power portion of the free Workplace Courage Acts Index, so www.workplaceai.com. And Jim, where can people find you? Where can they find out more about your work? And then I'll do the end quote, and then I'll let you finish today's show. Great. So the easiest ways to find me are either a hook up with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to do that. Or you can just go to my website, uh, which is just jimdeter.com, J-M-D-T-R-T, jimdeter.com. Uh, that website has links to the Courage X Index um, that Aiden just mentioned and um, cases and other curriculum I develop and information about the book. So um, website's a great way to sort of learn more about what I do. Fantastic, Jim. I'm going to end my portion of the show with the, a couple of quotes. The first is by Maya Angelou, and the second is by you. And then I'd love you to, to close the show with your message to our audience. So Maya Angelou beautifully said, courage is the most important of all the virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. I love that because that, that came to mind as I read your book. And then the quote by you, Jim, is as follows. Workplace courage is taking action because it feels right to stand for a principle, a cause, or a group of others, despite the potential for serious career, social, psychological, or even physical repercussions for doing so. Workplace courage comes in many forms. It is speaking truth to power and to peers, subordinates, and other stakeholders whose behavior is causing problems or falling short of what's possible. And it includes acts aimed at personal and organizational growth, such as taking on stretch assignments, owning bold initiatives, and innovating within or beyond one's current organization. I absolutely love that. It spoke to the very essence of this show, Jim. It spoke to me, and I think it's a wonderful book. One last message to our audience. Sign up for the innovationshow.io newsletter. I have a brand new copy up for grabs to be sent anywhere in the world. Jim, I'd love if you close today's show. Yeah, thank you so much for this great conversation. I, I'll end by actually um, going back to um, the first quote you shared. You know, people indeed have said that that courage is the most important of the virtues because without it, the others um, are really not possible. I would encourage going back to this idea of setting aside the myth that it's an innate quality and instead realizing that it's a responsibility and a possibility for all of us to develop the skills to say this about other virtues. You know, we don't we don't say when we think about other important virtues, we don't say, hey, Let's hope that 10% of people are honest 10% of the time. Or, geez, let's hope that a quarter of us are kind and decent about half the time. Or let's hope that um, our employees are prudent uh, and show moderation, you know, once in a while, or at least some of them, right? If you think about any other virtue, it's something we expect of all of ourselves most of the time. And so... Why would we take acting courageously, especially if we agree that it's the most important of the virtues, as the responsibility of a few of us just sometimes? That's the definition of letting ourselves off the hook. And so uh, I'm not asking anybody to be an organizational martyr, to speak up every time it's possible. But I am saying there are ways to learn to do it competently and to end up living a life that you feel good about, not one that's filled with regrets. And so I, I don't know what that is for each of you, but I hope you'll take that next step. Author of Choosing Courage, The Everyday Guide to Being Brave at Work, Jim Dietert, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Awesome, Jim. Fist bump through the virtual fist bump, man. <laughs>